All right, um, okay. welcome to those um, joining us in the live stream um, later uh, for Christian Iantono's final thesis defense titled On an Invisible Architecture. We have two external reviewers with us this morning. Anne Cormier is founding principal of Atelier Big City and associate professor in architecture at the Université de Montréal. And Court Sin is studio director at Forec. Welcome to both of you. Christian's thesis committee includes Cheryl Atkinson as supervisor, Colin Ripley as second reader, and myself, John Serka, as program representative. Christian, you have uh, 20 minutes for your presentation, and then we will discuss um, the, your thesis for the remaining 40 minutes. So please proceed. Okay, thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, and uh, just before I start the video, uh, there's a couple um, points in the video where like the screen fades to black and I just don't want anyone to think that uh, like they're losing connection or something. So it's, it's part of the video. On an Invisible Architecture by Christian Yen and Tuono. Invisible, something that is unseen, unnoticed, or ignored. Related to the awareness or recognition of an object as opposed to its actual presence, the problem with the invisible is the unknowingness of its very existence. As our bodies occupy diverse spatial conditions, they absorb a variety of visible and invisible information through the senses. Today, in our digital-centric and globalized culture, individuals have found themselves engrossed by the information gathered through the retinas, using our eyes as a means of relating to, navigating, and thus deriving meaning from our surrounding environments. As the fundamental event of the digital age progresses towards the world as picture, the supremacy of vision has been reinforced by a horde of technological innovations and the endless multiplication and production of images. We live in an image society one where we predominantly rely on the eye as a method for extracting new knowledge from our individualized context. Beginning in the neoclassical and then in the Renaissance and early modern periods, the eye was understood as the noblest of the senses, giving sight the ultimate primacy within the human condition. In ancient Greek philosophy, Plato derived meaning from the human experience through the eye, understanding it as a source of divine inspiration and truth in a world of darkness, uncertainty, and unknowns. This emphasis on sight within the human experience began a disconnect between our bodily intuition and the totality of our sensorial apparatuses. In an age of empiricism, enlightenment, and the scientific method, our faith in the image became the primary source of information to the human experience. Additionally, modernism and our contemporary architecture's obsession with glass, light, and proportion resulted in a further subconscious association between architecture, vision, and the eye. We say we will believe it when we see it, and that seeing is believing. We engage these questions of the human condition subconsciously through the lens of the eye, all while understanding the image as a source of reason and logic. Through our dependence on the eye and the human condition, a societal shift from the fullness of the senses has not only altered the ways we viewed and approached architecture, but it has also profoundly transformed our methods of creating, designing, and representing them as well. One possible hypothesis for the reason we tend to think of architecture as a primarily visual endeavor is due to the fact that we represent architecture through visual means. Since the Renaissance, the architectural drawing and sketch began laying the foundations for understanding architecture visually through the interface between the eye and the paper. Today, the use of sophisticated digital media in our own profession further compounds a clear visual bias in architectural thinking, often resulting in a privileging of the aesthetic over the bodied experience. The problem with fully computer-generated designs is the fact that they take place in a world where the observer has no skin, hands, or body one where the designer becomes a bodiless observer and remains an outsider in relation to the architecture and body. In the public eye, the architect no longer creates intimate spaces for the memory of the user, but rather creates beautified objects simply for the visual consumption of society. This has resulted in buildings designed as landmarks on the skylines of big cities, commissioned both to attract capital and to express the power of investment. In effect, alienating the built environment from its inhabitants and simultaneously strengthening the non-place. As our ocular bias over the last half century has intensified, a type of architecture aimed at striking a memorable visual image has predominated the landscape of urbanity. This iconization manifested in the contemporary era has not only damaged the way society understands the practice of architecture, but it also limits the very way architecture is engaged with beyond vision. In speculating on an invisible architecture, 
we are not inherently saying that architecture should not be seen or understood. Instead, through addressing the necessity of the eye in the contemporary era, we can propose the framework of architecture to be used as a tool in engendering new sensorial reactions to space. In the same way we can only understand the true power of music with silence, the light of architecture can only be known through an understanding of the darkness it frames. The need for the senses in our interaction with a geography requires architecture to act as the matter framing our own sensory interactions. Today, the engagement of our senses in architecture places an emphasis on the ones furthest away from the body. The sense of sight projects the body to great distances, pushing us further into detachment and isolation in our lived experiences. Instead of the traditional privileging of the senses furthest away from the body like sight, we should instead be focusing on the intimacy of the other senses and their closeness to the consciousness of the body. Bringing architecture to the level of the material, transition, and detail brings the traditional outsider of the non-place to a more intimate proxemic relationship with the space. Contrary to the distancing effects of sight, touch is one of the closest senses to the body, having the innate ability to physically connect the body to its surroundings. Both physical and psychological, touch evokes intimacy and attachment. We validate what we believe to be true with haptic confirmation, as we refer to things that are real and definitive as tangible. The haptics of the body make the human experience in space real, as opposed to the projected image the contemporary environment creates in spaces. Thermoception uses the skin as a boundary between the body and an atmosphere, separating them and clearly defining its outermost layer of protection. Thermal conductivity between objects and the skin turn environmental stimuli into perceivable sensory information. Thermoception's place within the sensorial envelope further conveys haptic information to the mind, ultimately continuing the understanding of the body in space. Sound allows for an understanding of volume, but also of a space's hardness, roughness, softness, and other material qualities. In Plasma's writing on the sensory stimulation of sound, the ear has the extraordinary capacity to carve a volume of space into the void of darkness within the interior of the mind. Today, however, our ears have become suppressed as an indirect result of mechanical hums, mundane materials, and an overall misunderstanding of the auditorial potentials of architecture. The olfactory sense of smell is most prominently linked to our individual memories and experiences. As a result, environmental psychologists believe that more natural settings like forests hold strong calming sensations through their ability to integrate the senses in their experiences of place. The sense of smell in contemporary architectural non-places has been completely supplemented through the overabundance of chemically derived materials for their sterilizing qualities and the volatile organic compounds they produce. The environment-behavior relationship between people and space is affected by the fact that individuals have a limited capacity to process incoming stimuli. As an individual's capacity for attention reaches its maximum, it results in a reactionary overload and a type of tunnel vision, alienating the self in space. Additionally, psychological studies also seem to indicate that though extreme stimulation can be troublesome, the environment should sometimes be made more complex and stimulating in order to restore excitement and a sense of belonging to individuals in their environment. In reintroducing the invisible, we are not simply identifying things that are missing from our environments, but rather, we are enabling a broader understanding of spatial effects and the recognition that comes with it. The lack of designing for the other senses reduces the world to a plane of vision, one that remains a screen played out in front of us, and ultimately, one that cannot be engaged with in any meaningful or authentic way. Located between Bloor Street East and Rosedale Valley Road on a branch of Toronto's Don River Valley sits the investigative site. The juxtaposition between these two geographies, the natural and the urban, provides the setting for an architectural investigation into the senses and the ways they might be used in grounding an individual in a full-bodied experience. Ultimately, the site will offer a new territorial atlas for people to explore their senses in an architectural experience, allowing them to recognize the transformative potential of design. Today, an atlas has been misunderstood as a simple book of maps. First defined by Gerardus Mercator in 1595, an atlas describes the creation and form of the whole universe, not simply as a collection of maps and images, but rather a collection of moments that represent the mappings of geographic, political, social, and other influential factors of a particular region in relation to the body. The atlas attempts not to simply form a building, gallery, or pavilion to amuse and arouse people along their journeys, but rather attempts to allow for a richer and deeper understanding of one's own sensorial envelope and the ways it might be used in understanding the built form around us. Walking along Rosedale Valley Road, the heavily forested hillside provides a level of seclusion for the natural geography of the ravine, hidden away from the city above. 
As the individual walks, they are gradually presented with a variety of changing acoustical, olfactory, temperature, and other sensory stimuli as a result of the entrance to the atlas. Made of a number of corten steel fins that provide paths to the interior of the building, the structure protrudes from the hillside, gradually encapsulating the individual as they begin their journey to the city. The fins also carry with them sensory information and stimuli through their form and materiality. The steel reverberates and resonates, radiates temperature, and transfers sounds and smells from a variety of different locations throughout the site, both natural and urban. It is because of this that each steel protrusion will bring its own unique quality to the individual experience, not only between the different choices of paths, but also through the passage of time and the changes it brings to the surrounding environment. Upon entering the atlas, the bodily senses are absorbed, beginning at the outermost projections of the body and working inwards. The steel tunnels become darker as users make their way into the hillside of the ravine. Though the space becomes filled with darkness, it is not empty. The subterranean form begins to muffle both noises from the natural landscape and the distant hum of the enervated city. The steel, being naturally reverberant, begins to display a texture of patterned holes to form a gradient of sound and stimuli from reflective to absorptive. Individuals begin their journeys through the intimate encounters of touch and hapticity, as the formal handshake between the user and the building connects them both emotionally and physically. Here, the familiar has no place, as the strangeness and serendipity of the space seems to provide some form of curiosity and interest while guiding the journey. Through this threshold, the first of the intimate spaces comes to life. This space, again, offers individuals the framework of an atlas, allowing them to make their own serendipitous encounters and journeys based on environmental stimulations and the unique memories they provoke. Encountering a variety of rooms, spaces, and experiences, this space acts as a channel for both circulation as well as sensory stimulation. The space is filled with a number of apertures and wells, funneling a variety of stimuli from around the site. Subway sounds, pressures, and smells, street traffic, as well as the natural ravine above, connect the individual moment through its sounds, smells, textures, and temperatures that all agglomerate within the chambers. Materially stratified, the concrete, stone, and water add to the complexity of the environment, somewhat disorienting the individual as they must now begin to rely on the other sensory information present in the environment to not only navigate, but to fully make sense of their place within the complex labyrinth of the city. The second event of dislocation involves the disruption of something seen as normal. Peter Eisenman believed that the paradox of architecture must involve the dislocation of the traditional interpretation of its elements if it has any hope in reinventing a site, place, history, or system of meaning. From here, the journey through the atlas can take on a number of different directions, but regardless, the navigation of these spaces requires one to dislocate themselves from traditional spatial wayfinding and trust their other senses, the invisible ones. Here, individuals find themselves in a recessed courtyard. One of the apertures existing on the site, the courtyard is inspired by the Japanese Zen garden, not attempting to mimic nature, but rather framing it in a space that is not natural, yet not entirely manufactured. The juxtaposition between metal grate and earth, sky and submersion, seeing and touching, all contribute to the dislocative experience in this chamber. Extending above grade, the metal grate mesh aims to capture the wind on the site as it proportionally lines up with adjacent buildings to do so. This creates an ever-changing resonance and reverberation throughout the cage that changes with each season, day, hour, and minute, further stimulating the body with haptic confirmation of the self in space. The atlas contains a number of places that promote movement, contemplation, lingering, resting, and congregating as the architecture becomes part of a lived and used experience for the individual and not a simple place of passage. The hallway, sloped with a ramp to suggest movement, also contains a number of cutaways for resting, congregating, and contemplating. These spaces, though along a place of movement, offer an intimate moment for the individual to sit below a small circular aperture to the sky. Leaning against board-formed concrete suggestive of the space's making, the environment thermally reacts to the temporality of season and atmosphere. Along the other wall, vertically oriented wood louvers provide the space with a unique olfactory, texture, and sound stimuli, as the wood reacts with the water running along its base. The space is in constant flux, both with the invisible stimuli of the environment, as well as the passage of journeys through its corridor. Moving through to another aperture in the site, the individual has another opportunity to sit, linger, and contemplate in this dislocative experience. This recessed courtyard is smaller in scale, offering opportunities for more intimate reflection to those who may stumble upon it on their journeys. The courtyard represents a juxtaposition between the natural and the built, 
as the concrete hallway leads to a natural dirt and gravel ground cover, mediated by vertically lined walls of scorched wood. The wood represents a fusion of both the natural and the built, as the technique for preserving the wood alters the material from its natural state while also emitting a strong olfactory stimuli. The walls angle obtusely, offering individuals the opportunity to actively engage with the form and materiality of the architecture. As a result, the individual becomes further dislocated from their traditional understanding of spatial occupation in the digitized city and what it means to navigate it. Ascending a stairs serves as an opportunity to engage the closeness of touch and temperature in the body. The interaction between the hands and the feet through the ascension of the stairs begins at the handrail. The handrail uses two materials, oak and brass, as it interplays with their unique conductance, texture, and thermoceptive qualities in order to convey necessary information to the body in space through environmental stimulation. As the hand grasps the wood and begins to move up the stairs, sharp perceptible transitions in thermal conductivity trigger a sensory reaction in the body as the hand moves over the metal. Brass, having a high thermal conductivity amongst metals, transfers environmental information through the intimacy of the hand on the railing, signifying a changing in direction reflected in the movement of the feet on the steps. This transaction between body and architecture, though having an inevitable visual component, relies on the reactivity of the individual's sensory perception in order to guide and orient them through the rediscovery of their senses in space. The next space on the journey, framed by charred wood on its walls and ceiling, creates a dark atmosphere rich in smell and texture. Small and light metal chains hang down from the ceiling, creating a physical atmosphere within the space of the room. Being made of brass, their perceived coldness offers a shock to the body's thermal receptors. The void thus becomes a fluid solid, allowing individuals to create their own path and journey through their ability to touch and feel their way through the void. Sand on the floor furthers the dislocative essence of the space, while the displacement of the ground cover from past journeys alludes to a commonality between estranged people on their way to the city. Unable to be seen, a white noise of falling water grows as one traverses down the space, leading to a narrow sliver in the wall and into the final moments of the journey through the atlas, restitution. Returning something that is lost or stolen, the atlas now attempts to reintegrate people within the framework of the urban geography. Here, the source of past stimulations becomes known, provided by the structure of the architecture. The waterfall encapsulates this courtyard, its energy and power felt deep within the body. Gravel lies beneath the feet as one walks, adding to this white noise surrounding the body. The water falls along the vertical surface of the core tent steel, adding to its temporality and forming a patina of age over time. The water here falls into a grate that feeds past spaces, constantly rejuvenating numerous elements of stimulation within the atlas. Here, water is used as not only a material, but as just one of the natural elements that flux between the natural geography and the built one in the atlas, helping to bridge the two environments together. Ascending the stairs to the urban geography above, individuals have the opportunity to touch the water wall, to feel its temperature, and to smell the interaction between the steel, water, wood, and mist. This moment continues as one climbs the stairs, ultimately leading to the other end of the atlas. Finally, individuals find themselves at grade with Bloor Street East. The waterfall courtyard intersects with a grid of wooden post and beam construction. The grid begins a dialogue between the urban form of the architecture and its relationship to its surroundings. The grid diffuses sound, smells, textures, and atmospheres through the wood's materiality itself, as well as through the transparency of cloth diffusing individuals within the innovated city. As they meander through the lattice, the city becomes more clear while the white noise of the atlas fades away, completing one possible transition of the two geographies and with it, a new understanding of the sensory interactions of space and self. Through this formal design strategy, an individualized story and experience can unfold through the body's senses in hopes of discovering new sensorial engagements and relationships between the individual and a space. The intimacy of the senses allows one to become closer to architecture, both physically and psychologically providing an atlas to the senses upon traversing the geographies of the human condition. In addressing our ocular-centric and digital society through spatial problem-solving and acknowledging the potential for the senses to generate more relatable moments, we have the ability to create new spatial, perceptual, and emotional relationships within the memory of architecture. While I do see the benefits to digital technologies to a number of fields, architecture included, I am questioning whether the meaning of architectural expression should lie within them as through the digital, we lose part of the true, unrepeatable human condition.
An invisible architecture succeeds when these sensory stimulations provoked by our constructed environments become perceptions in the mind of the individual. It is at this moment within the human consciousness that memory is formed, creating both a physical attachment to place as well as forever altering our past, present, and future. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. <clears throat> Thanks. Leo, yeah, could you stop sharing so that Christian can get his PDF up? Yep. Yeah, I stopped it. And um, uh, hopefully we'll get much clearer images, Christian. Yeah. It was unfortunate that your uh, beautiful images were at such a low resolution. <clears throat> um, do we have any questions of clarification to start the discussion? That's much better. <laughs> I wish we yeah. had that for the presentation. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Um, can you uh, thank you, Christian, for the well? Even if the the image quality were not there, it was a very good presentation. In a way, it's it may be good that the image weren't there because your <laughs> the whole point is about. Uh, not using the sense of vision so much. So I must say that I really enjoy your text and the way you, you read it. It was uh, very carefully done. <coughs> Sorry. My, my question is, and maybe you said it or you wrote it and I, it, I missed it, is why, um, why an atlas rather than another program? Um, I think earlier on in the thesis, when I was toying around with uh, like programs and what to actually use to sort of generate a design, um, I, I, I was sort of stuck calling it like a pavilion or a gallery. Um, oh, that's actually, that's not my, qu my question is more, uh, why not a restaurant or a concert hall? Um, well, I guess the um, early on, it's, it started with looking at like the non-place uh, and, and the idea of super modernity and Marc Auger's uh, writing um, and looking at sort of spaces uh, of, and places of transit um, within our sort of lived condition and how uh, those, a lot of those spaces sort of become problematic in terms of actually being able to engage with them and um, uh, uh, them becoming part of like that lived experience in, in someone's life, I guess. Okay, so, so if I, I'll ask you next, uh, I don't want to take too much time, but why not a mall in that case? Um, yeah, I, and I think like, uh, Earlier on, I was leaning towards something with like a stronger program like that. Like, then I specifically looked at case studies of malls earlier on. Um, but I think I chose this sort of site specifically just uh, based on that idea of sort of entering the this sort of enervated city. And uh, in Marco J's writing, he talks about this sort of, uh, and uh, as well as other writing by like Anthony Vidler. Uh, uh, T looking at the sort of relationship between the person and the city and like this idea of the new metropolis in the, the early 20th century. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted uh, some, a, a, a more dynamic program in a way that would allow me to uh, focus more on like the actual relationship between like a built architecture and uh, the body rather than focusing on sort of specific program per se. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Christian. Um, just, just the, this is a big question for me. Uh, I appreciate everything that you put, put it together. Uh, I agree with, with Anne, it, it was actually uh, better 
for us to not see this level of detail during the presentation because it allowed us to rely less on it. Um, mm -hmm. Question for you is what what is your definition of place? Because I think that seems to be the underlying uh, reason for this thesis. W what is your definition? Yeah, so I guess um, I talk about place as some uh, like strongly attached with sort of like an individual uh, memory and I guess some uh, like a place of uh, I don't know if I actually said it in the speech but uh, a place of essentially um, his historical uh, social or uh, sort of personal significance to someone so uh, in that way I guess uh, a place uh, would I, I think the definition of place would vary from person to person just based on uh, like your individual experiences and memories and how uh, uh, how those sort of like evolve within the mind. So it's it's kind of like a fluid definition, but uh, I, I guess it's something, uh, a space of like significance in a way. Okay, because I'm glad that you, because for me, I, I'm in complete agreement. Um, you know, non-places are, are, you're treated as, as a label, as a type, rather than an individual. Yeah. So my, my follow-up question then is, and, I, and I, I'm glad that you bring it up, is that you, you mentioned in, in the presentation that there, the individual is meant to provoke a unique memory, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So how this, this edifice, this, uh, this uh, procession mm -hmm. um, with different apertures of options, um, yeah. how, how do you imagine uh, I call it a guest, but how do you imagine the guest or the individual to uh, traverse it? Is it meant to be only one person at a time or is it, how does it change when there's more than one person or a loved one versus a stranger? I, I'm just curious because I, I, uh, it, it adds another layer to what you've created. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, the intent wasn't for like a single person to move through the space. It's sort of, uh, almost uh, like uh, I'll use the word like a park pavilion just for the sake of like clarity and but uh, essentially it's a space that can be occupied by like any number of people um, and and uh, also at the same time not uh, ch uh, I think one challenge that I had was not having it so linear and allowing these sort of different options based uh, and all of these sort of different paths that you can take within the building I think are like heavily influenced by your own personal uh, what like sense of place and the the way the sort of environmental stimuli uh, reacts with your own memories and and that sort of leads that progression through space. So from person to person, that uh, uh, that would kind of change. Uh, and additionally, uh, I guess one use of the space would be to even use it backwards. Um, and, and that sort of the, the, um, the architecture sort of causes those, uh, different perceptions in the mind through, uh, those various stimuli that, that the detailing is actually providing. I was, I was sort of wondering why you kept, um, the sight, the sense of sight in your, in your atlas kept the sense of sight as in like vision? Yes. Um, well, I, I think th that's, that was sort of the tricky part was uh, the, throughout this whole process, it was like a real challenge to um, sort of pull myself out of that mindset of designing for an aesthetic or for, for vision. Uh, and I think it's something that you can't, uh, like in, in architecture, I don't think you can fully get completely divorce yourself from that that idea of vision just simply based on the fact that like it's it, vision is also part of our sensory apparatus right it's still part of that human condition um so I, i'm not necessarily saying like the that the building should sort of exist in complete darkness and you you sort of engage with it that way but uh, i think throughout the process i tried to um really uh focus on the other senses and how those can be used 
in uh, sort of guiding someone through space or provoking different memories or provoking different sort of perceptions of the building rather than uh, designing it through some some sort of aesthetic or or uh, yeah, but that, I think that's the that's quite a critical element in your thesis. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's and it's a bit contradictory in a way because um, you're talking about an invisible architecture. And yet, I'm not sure of what, what we're going to be, what is it that we're really judging now? Because actually, our, our whole experience of your thesis, apart from hearing your narrative, has essentially been visual. And uh, so what are we talking about? Are we talking about um, the idea of the atlas? Is it what we are discussing? Um, to some extent, it's difficult for us to judge of the actual um, presence of the, the or how can I say, it's difficult to judge of what we would feel or sense or hear. And actually there's one thing that I'm a bit surprised you didn't work with, given the subject is you didn't um, work with sound other than your voice in your presentation. And yeah. that is something that you could have done even with this type of media. I understand that if we were in the same room, it would be possible for us to touch certain things. Mm -hmm. But um, was that a, a decision not to use the sound as a communication device? Uh, and, and do you mean using sound like in the presentation or using sound in the building as a communication? I believe you use sound in the building yeah. because uh, there's different texture on which somebody mm -hmm. walk, for instance, and probably there's different ways sound uh, if people talk or there's going to be different reverberation, but in, in your presentation, this is mute in yeah. a way, and the visible is very visible. And I know it's a challenge because the subject of uh, the sense in architecture is a is quite a challenge to, to tackle in itself. Yeah, yeah, I think it, the presentation could have probably um, incorporated some of those other senses as uh, like as challenging it. I'd, like to, I'd like to jump in if I can, Christian, because um, this is a question of, yeah. of representation. Um, mm -hmm. And um, really the implication here in um, having, or the, the, the call to simulate all of the senses that somehow you would bring some heat and some coolness into the room and so forth, these would still become representations. And, you know, I think that we're um, misunderstanding architecture if we um, require um, all of this um, kind of theatricality, because what we do as architects is um, uh, the, the architecture goes beyond the drawing, just like it goes beyond the building. And so having to um, um, engage in the theatricality of bringing in um, selective um, um, senses, sounds, smells, whatever, they would have been here there to an extent as Anne was pointing out if we were in the room, um, you, you may have had your charred wooden model and that would have had a bit of an odor. But you know, I think the, these can come incidentally I, I understand that odor. I have, you know, a, a lifetime of memory of these materials and sounds and everything else. And so you had a very eloquent presentation 
that um, did present these sensory, the sensory realm for us. And I personally have no problem with this as a form of representation. I got it. I didn't need a smellorama to be able to understand that. And, and smellorama comes from a John Waters film, by the way. Um, you know, it could be done. We could have had little scratch and sniff strips um, along with the presentation. But I think that that would have become actually um, simply theater and not actually um, a discussion of the architectural ideas. So I, I, I don't share that same problem. But may I, I, I would add to that, why do we need the visual then? Um, why we need that is because um, a blind architecture is is an extremely um, specific and uh, difficult feat to achieve well. And that's exactly what that would become, is a blind architecture. I think it goes beyond that, John. Um, I, I, I think I have a third position in relation to this. And it's that um, there, there's a difference between architecture and bear with me, it's gonna take me a moment to get this idea across. Uh, but to a certain extent, Christian, mm -hmm. this is gonna sound like I'm being critical and I'm, I'm not really, okay? But to a certain extent, your project is a collection of devices that produce certain effects. Right. Um, could you could say that that it's a collection of gimmicks, in a way, right? You get this yep. smell, you get this sound, you get this this air, you get this this other sound, you get some vibration, bingo, bango, you're done, right? Um, and um, you know, I, I've. I've seen a lot of projects or a fair number of projects that have tried to deal with non-visual issues in architecture. Uh, I've done some myself. And it, my feeling is that they almost always come down to this collection of gimmicks, collection of devices. And where that leaves me is the question of, is that collection of devices in itself architecture? And I think my intuition is that it's not architecture. It's simply constructional devices. So the, the question for me is how do you develop a system that allows us to organize all of these devices and understand them, understand them not as separate moments, mm -hmm. even separate memories, but as a collected, composed, organized, developed system. And unfortunately, or fortunately, at the moment, I think the only mechanism we have for doing that is visual, right? It's not so much that you're showing us what the thing looks like and not smelling to us what it smells like, mm -hmm. it's that the idea of how you could make us understand the organization of this whole project at one time by giving us a collection of smells is not possible. You could only do it sequentially, right? Whereas yeah. visually, you can give us an understanding of the architecture of the whole thing because we can understand the way the, way the entire assembly is organized. Mm -hmm. Sorry if that's off base, but that's that's my thinking here. That it's not so much about. It's actually that what's being represented. You want what's being represented. I think to be the architecture and not simply specific moments within the building. Mm -hmm. Well, I I do agree with that point, um, and I think like when I. I as I sort of tried to develop the moments from milestone three until this point, um, I, I think I, I tried to um, 
to tried to make it a little bit less episodic, like we talked about in Milestone 3 a little bit, where, uh, uh, but, but I, again, that sort of, I found that a little bit challenging just based on the fact that I talk about vision being able to sort of project the body to great distances. Um, and, and you can sort of perceive something very easily by sort of projecting yourself to a different location through vision. Uh, and, and that sort of becomes very challenging when you don't look at these, or, or I found it very challenging when you don't look at these uh, sort of intimate moments, when, like when you're talking about proxemics and uh, Edward T. Hall's work, uh, when you don't sort of using uh, those more intimate spaces and moments to, to drive, to, to bring those uh, sort of gimmicks and details uh, beyond gimmicks and details and sort of bring that into uh, like a spatial realm that exists. I, like I believe it exists as architecture at that point. Uh, and I think that the only, or one of the only differences would be uh, the actual perception of the individual. Because I think, I think almost without, without people interacting with this building and, and this like progression of spaces, I think they almost do exist as these uh, these sort of just objects, subterranean objects in a field. And I think the distinction lies somewhere between um, the like the object itself and how that object's sensory and environmental information is sort of transferred into your individual perception and memory. Yeah, yeah, and and I I think that this distinction is a kind of critical question for what constitutes architecture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it, is architecture constituted by the impressions of people who inhabit the space? Right. Whether they're getting those impressions through vision or through touch or whatever, mm -hmm. or is architecture constituted as a kind of, um, uh, 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 well, yeah, object? <laughs> no, 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 not as an object. Exactly not as an object, right? Or is, is, the, is a building, maybe I'll put it this way, is the building a representation of an architecture that, that came into being before the building was constructed? Yeah. Or, is, or is the architecture something that only comes in after the building is being understood by people using it. Yeah. It, it's right. almost and this like is a, a fundamental question. Yeah. Like, I think it's I think it's both. It operates. It's not either um, one or the other. Um, yeah, it could to be. come back to the point of um, to Colin's point, um, I think that Christian uh, has the intention of achieving an architecture here and, and I read that mostly in um, the discussion of Mercator's Atlas, that this becomes a model for the project. Um, and, and, but I think that in the end, um, the project still carries that kind of um, atomized um, and, and episodic, as, as you said, um, stringing of various sensory environments. Um, and so I think that the next thing would be to move toward really trying to capture that atlas, the idea of the atlas, and therefore the architecture. And I'd like to also come back to Anne's point. I mean, I also have the, um, had the question of, rather than speaking about program, the activity here. And again, I think that that um, might have pushed this to a level where um, you might have had to have con confronted the architecture here and, and more of the uh, integrative approach, uh, not just the reading. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, try, dealing with the program and how people used the spaces, I think that's what started to kind of bring it um, from where I think it was at Milestone 3, where it was more just a collection of objects, I think. I think there's. I think you could still have that focus on the senses, but they become a kind of momentary intensification. The way that it still comes across 
is that these are um, isolated moments for smell, for temperature, for touch. And, and I think, you know, in the end, um, the experience necessarily has to become more integrative because we can't separate those senses out. And it does become a matter of, of emphasis that yeah. one thing is, is brought forward more, like let's say smell um, momentarily, and then it fades away in the next space and sound comes up. And I think, you know, that's what you're yeah. trying to achieve. Um, yeah. But and I, um, and I think integration also, is not there. Sorry. I, yeah. And I think also uh, like within those moments, I, I just kind of wanted to make it clear just in case uh, I was sort of like mis misunderstood, but I'm not uh, trying to sort of isolate individual senses in different spaces or different moments, because I think, uh, especially looking at like uh, Merleau-Ponty's uh, work to, where he talks about the idea that you can't separate sense. Like, I think it's almost impossible. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's most likely impossible to sort of fully separate and isolate senses for a specific purpose uh, because like the human condition works in a gl agglomeration. Like it works, uh, they all work sort of together. So within all of those moments, um, although I, it, in the reading and in the moment, the, the sort of representation of it, I talk about, I might talk about one or two or a couple different senses and how they interact in those spaces. Um, uh, that's not to say that, uh, uh, like different perceptions might, uh, also sort of be enabled by the architecture. It's, it's sort of very dependent on, um, an individual's perception. And I think, uh, uh, I'm just trying to sort of use these different combinations and uh, these designed stimulations to just trigger that per that memory and that perception within people, not necessarily knowing what it's going to provoke, but uh, I think just the very act of provoking it uh, makes makes that relationship between the person and the architecture a lot more clear. And, and I think that's like ultimately what I'm trying to do in this in the progression through the space. It's like you're offering, offering a promise of sensation. And that's, I think, all we can do is, as architects, offer yeah. a promise of something. Yeah, and I, I think that's also something that's missing in like Marc Auger's work with, or not in his work, but in when he talks about uh, the non-place. I think that's something that's like fundamentally missing from these non-places. And I think that is ultimately what makes the distinction between uh, a space that becomes sort of memorable and and relatable in a space that's sort of just uh, pass uh, that you sort of just pass by and and don't really uh, engage with. And I think it lies uh, in in how it relates to the body and how uh, the body sort of perceives it ends up perceiving. You could take um, Merlo Ponti's um, uh, very uh, late. Uh, conception of the flesh of the world and see that as um, a program for architecture that we're here to design the flesh of the world mm. in that sense. I, I think that that's um, lurking behind your intentions. Yeah. Is that a uh, like a work that he wrote, the flesh of the no, world? That's just a phrase that he used, the flesh of the world. Uh. I have never heard of that. You'll find it in his I late. That relates a lot to what I'm trying to do. And the idea of being underground, mm -hmm. where does it come from? Um, yeah, so they're in choosing the site. Uh, uh, originally, the site was chosen because of the 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 sort of difference between the natural geography at at the sort of base of the ravine and the urban geography at the upper part of the ravine, uh, and being uh, placing the building underground, uh, I think was one of the initial steps that I sort of took in the design process. Where, um, what when I was when I was trying to sort of uh, focus on the sort of intimacy between the body and architecture and the skin of the building and the skin of the body and how those two interact. I think naturally I tried to get away from the idea of this sort of external facade that might make the building seem as though it's like a, a sort of an object in, in a park or an object that, to, to sort of be like visually consumed. And I think placing the building underground removed that uh, 
that outer facade to be seen in a way. Uh, and it allowed me to just focus on um, the sort of design of the skins, basically, uh, essentially, like this, the design of the skin of the building and how that interacts when it's used with the design of the skin of like the, the being moving through the space. So, so there's a, that beautiful drawing that is on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. um, what did you had in mind when you drew it? What? Um, so the it's a essentially this is a an X-ray view axonometric. Mm -hmm. um, so b before this in the presentation, I just sort of represented all of these. Uh, moments, these sort of uh, distorted and broken down perspective views of these moments. Um, and I, I, even in designing the building uh, throughout the process, I, uh, and I think even like uh, Cheryl might be able to like attest to this slightly where uh, I, I never really focused on the building, like the sort of ob what this object of the building looked like. Uh, and the, the process was uh, kind of very focused on those moments and then seeing what came, so designing through those moments and then seeing what sort of object was produced by those moments, because I think the object um, wasn't uh, the sort of driving factor. It was more the, the interaction with the moments. Um, so, so is that drawing, was that drawing a surprise to you when you drew it? I think parts of it um, are like when I started combining all of these moments, uh, I, I like, I think it's clear how uh, al almost uh, the moments almost look slightly fragmented. Like they almost look like they could each be their own sort of individual object that's dissociated from the next space. But I think when combining them in that narrative, that's what starts to form um, the actual sort of whole of the architecture and how it's perceived through the journey. But I think looking at sort of each section of that AXO on its own, you almost get, uh, it's, it's almost in a way, a number of different uh, objects and buildings almost uh, that are interacting with one another. Looking, well, looking at it, it's, it's really interesting. It, it get me thinking about um, is, is shape or the perception, what is the perception of shape in the end? It's, maybe it's not visual, maybe it's movement. Uh, it seems to me that there's a, well, it's all about perception and it's it seems to me that there's something in this drawing which is about us knowing how to get into the drawing and uh, imagine being in it and I, I think it's quite interesting but I'm somehow I'm feeling there's uh, a a sense that we, it's almost like if there's a sense that we don't know about and that sort of exists when we look at that, at that uh, drawing. And I don't know what that sense is exactly. And it's not, uh, it's not touch, it's not smell, it's not a sound, it's not even visual. It's more like if movement could be a sense, but yeah, 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 yeah. Mm, that's I, interesting. I, 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 I get you. I, I want to say that it's the it's an architectural sense. Well, there's another one that um, I think is also uh, even closer, um, uh, the haptic sense, um, which does involve proprioception and and touch. Um, so um, senses do start to combine, and that's basically. Um, J.J. Gibson's contribution as, of the senses as perceptual systems. And I think in this case, the haptic sense and, and maybe even um, attaching a bit more to it um, um, 
uh, does become very central. And, and it's true. I think that that, that becomes a, an important architectural sense to yeah. make actually the other kind of sense, to make sense of the project and the space and the architecture. Yeah. Although I, I'm, I'm kind of phrasing it in a slightly different manner. When I say an architectural sense, it might mean, it might, it's not so much, you know, even the haptic sense I think of as something that operates at, at quite a close distance, right? Mm -hmm. but, but I'm thinking, you know, that there's a kind of organizational sense, a sense mm -hmm. that we have as humans, and some of us have it more developed and animals have it as well, of the way something is organized. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, yeah. I think, I think, you know, that's what we really get. What I get, at least, from a drawing like this, it's not really visual. But it might be that I, that my that I'm getting the sense impression visually, but there's an organizational understanding mm -hmm. that I get from this. Mm -hmm. You know, of the various components. I don't know what they are in this building from this drawing, but I have an, or, an idea that, you know, there's something down on the right hand side that's kind of tail like that's that looks like it's organizing movement of kind of streaming and then there's something kind of centralized in the middle. And then there's some other big thing that has some some light in it up at the, the left top left hand side. Right. Mm -hmm. and I don't know what they are. It's only through through uh, Christians presentation that I understand more about these things, but I already understand that there are these moments that there's this organization of the project as a whole. And, and I, I think that's fundamental. Yeah. I, I would agree. It's otherwise when he was presenting it just as a series of vignettes, it's theater, it's not architecture. It's, it's a series of composed, stage sets that are there to promote a, a response and create an effect. And so the section, and uh, you haven't really drawn a plan, have you yet, Christian, or you may uh, never- Yes, yeah. I'll put it up yeah, on the screen. So it's as close as we'll get to it, but yeah. I'd love to see a plan because I think that's, okay. Well, kind of, it's a plan. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> x-ray. You know. But, um, but it is, I think, understanding this, the, the volume, the spatial sequence, the uh, beginning and end are, are quite important to this being architecture rather than um, a story. Yeah. Piece of theater. I, think, I think we can also so, uh, speak comments because we're getting close to our hour. Sorry, Marco, go ahead. Yeah. Just going to say, for me, what, the interesting discussion that comes up is the distinction between what we might call representation and simulation. Mm -hmm. um, these these drawings, and you know, Colin earlier said something about you know, in order for us to understand the the project as a totality, we need to see it visually. Visually, yes, but but not as a visual simulation of the experience, which is what the vignettes are. Which I think I think that becomes an important distinction because the the representational quality of these drawings, especially the AXO isn't about simulating the experience of being in the space. It's about providing organizational information. And, and so I think, you know, this is maybe an aside, but it's just something that struck me um, that I wanted to bring up that the vignette drawings are more in that, like Cheryl saying in the realm of theater and the idea of simulation as opposed to representation. And I think that these are the architectural devices that we use for the understanding of the organization of space as opposed to the experience of it. So it's interesting because you know the 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 visual simulations, if we want to call them that, um, do tend to sort of contradict the idea of an invisible architecture. But when we start to see this as uh, in, in these kind of representational drawings, where we don't, we you're not placing us within the building; you're giving us the the overview of it. I think I think we can start to understand it more clearly that way. Mm -hmm. At least that's my take. Yeah, I, I think the, the, especially the AXO drawing, uh, I think I start to see how, or I started to see as I was, again, as I was sort of bringing 
the pieces, the sort of individualized pieces together, starting to see how those moments can not just play out as like a, a sort of vignette and this sort of moment that's divorced from an architecture, but uh, using the, the AXO as a way, and, and also like the plan and section as a way to uh, bring all those moments together in this progression and experience of uh, an architecture and then sort of imagine how that's sort of perceived within individuals. Cor, do you have any final comments? Yeah, I apologize for dropping off there for a little bit. Um, I, I uh, uh, just complimenting the, uh, the presentation. It's been a great discussion. Um, I just feel uh, just dovetailing into a lot of things that have just been said, just kind of incorporating the sort of kinesthetics, the haptic. Um, is there a, is there another layer that might be missing that we could apply, which is a level of technology that reaffirms the idea of prosemics? Because uh, the struggle that I had with this thesis is that uh, I, I, as much as we're talking about memory and place and being the individual, uh, even looking at this sort of image and I'm seeing like the, you know, I, I guess it's the size of my screen, but you're seeing the, the person in the space and it just, it, the sense of scale is, is a little bit challenging to understand. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether there, there, there could have been opportunities to kind of support these broader moves with some, I'm not gonna say, you know, graphic standards, but just something to kind of support the sense of scale to kind of allow the individual to, to immerse themselves into this big idea. So um, that kind of made sense. It's just uh, the, the scale versus the scale of the thesis is I'm having a, a little mm -hmm. challenge trying to understand that. So like bring your, you're saying almost having another layer of like a more in, uh, uh, an even more intimate. intimate scale. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, Anne? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a very, very interesting work. I'm very pleased to have, have the opportunity to, to see it and, and discuss it. There's a lot of very good question in there that you have uh, addressed and uh, congratulations. I'm, it's very good Thank work. Thanks. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you, Christian, and uh, thank you to our external reviewers, Anne Cormier and Court Sin, and to the committee as well. Um, Christian, we will um, now deliberate briefly, so if you can leave the meeting and then uh, you can connect with uh, Cheryl for a discussion after our committee discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. Thank you.